Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I love to see all these familiar faces, the moral support that we need up here. Thank you for joining us for our talk. We're gonna be talking about AI and automation and how it can supercharge and really revolutionize how we're doing certification study. I know we have this mindset of how we do cert study, but we all know AI and automation is upping the game in so many different areas and the certification prep is another one. All right, so I am joined. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how we're using automation in cert prep. Time management is a huge part of this because some of you are red hatters. You understand that what you have to do on your day to day to keep your job going and then fitting in uh, cert prep, it is a challenge and we'll provide some tips for that. Upskilling and maintaining these certifications. We have uh, three RHCAs here. So maintaining that certification is total is super critical. As with all good things, there are some bad things. We're going to talk about some pros and cons and give up some tips and tricks. So let me, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Angela Andrews and I'm a solution architect here at Red Hat. I was a systems administrator in higher ed for many years before becoming a Red Hatter. Um, if you've ever heard of Compiler Podcast, that's me, um, <laughs> and um, I do a lot of cool stuff here at Red Hat. I have a couple certs, and I thought this would be a good idea to bring this talk to the people, and so we can share a little bit about what we do. And next up is our friend Randy. Good afternoon. I'm Randy Romero. I'm a senior Ansible consultant with Red Hat. Uh, I am an RHCA level four. Um, one of the things I'm big on is uh, evangelizing automation, and I'm also known as a dad joke ambassador. So if I can get my daughter and son who are in college to roll their eyes, groan out loud, I have won. <laughs> and you have, you have a supporter in the building. <laughs> All right, who do we have next? We have Kush. Hey, yo, my name is Kush Gupta. I'm a solution architect here at Red Hat. I support the Department of Energy and some of our Capitol Hill customers like the House of Reps and Senate over here. Uh, originally, I was trying to be a software engineer, was not trying to be even at this conference, but you know, still here I am. Um, because I realized I like talking to people at least a little bit more than a 15 minute daily stand up and uh, really like this job. I've also got some certs, so happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Jordan. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Jordan Jacobs, um, also a solution architect. I support the aerospace and defense pod. My customer is the one and only Lockheed Martin because they keep me very busy. I'm also an RHCA, and I switched from a non-IT background. Um, I was, did a couple internships there in college, as well as directed research, and I found that, that computers were pretty cool. So I ended up at Red Hat, which is the perfect spot, did a switch to IT, and I'm glad I made the change. All right, so now you know a little bit about our panelists. We're gonna get started with our, our topics here. So automation and certification prep, why do we do it? So, and uh, Randy. How do you use automation in your exam prep? Uh, thank you, Angela. Oh. So one of the ways I use automation in my certification prep is uh, making my labs ephemeral, right? So it doesn't really matter whether you're using the cloud or your own homegrown lab. The big thing is automating the build so you can get the repetition, repetition in uh, for those keystrokes that you need to be proficient at a topic. And by making your lab ephemeral, by automating the build, the teardown, you can get those repetitions in very quickly. And I also use automation in my home lab because just what he said, um, you want to be able to repeat your environment as many times as possible. I also sometimes do it in the cloud when I'm not home attached to my home lab. I can bring some of those scripts out, do something in AWS or whatever. It's nice to be able to have that access um, using a virtualization platform, spinning up templates, scripts, Ansible, all of those things can help supercharge the ability to spin up your environment and actually spin it up wherever you need it to be. So I use a little bit of automation in my home lab for cert prep as well. So we're also talking about Gen AI, and Gen AI is all the rage. We're using it from writing cover letters to writing emails to our clients and our bosses, but how does it help supercharge your study? So I wanna ask Jordan this question. With AI becoming more ingrained in your success, how has AI improved the effectiveness of your certification prep? And also give me that flip side. What are those downsides as well? Yeah, AI has helped my studying tremendously, uh, really in two ways. 
Uh, the first way is, you know, we've all been there where you're reading documentation and it's just not clicking. You read it two, three, four times and it's just like, what am I looking at here? Um, that's where I'll put it into any generative AI prompt and I'll say spit this, spit this back to me as an, using an analogy. Um, and from that analogy, I'm able to draw a conclusion and understanding while also still comparing that to the documentation. Uh, the second way that has helped me is if there's a certain output that I have in mind that I need to get to, um, it helps me get there. Um, you may or may not know, but Red Hat exams are hands-on. So you have to have a really good understanding of commands, their options, um, their environmental variables in order to be successful on an exam. Um, and that's where ChatGPT or any generative, generative AI comes into play. I'll tell it to give me a specific output, throw a command at me, um, and I'll use that command that it's given me. I'll use documentation as well as the role.rhu environment, which I'm a huge advocate for, um, to test out that command, test out um, you know, whether that environmental, environmental variable exists that it's given me, because one thing to note about Gen AI is that it will hallucinate and it will do it confidently. It will tell you the wrong answer very confidently and you can go there and correct it and it will go in a loop. Um, so make sure you're careful um, and that you use other resources when using generative AI. It's a, it's a powerful tool, but it's not the only tool in the toolkit. So this question is for Randy, and it's kind of similar, but how has AI help and automation help improve your certification study? But compare it to the traditional methods that you used to use. Give me the. So the way I use generative AI is actually to supplement what I'm trying to do. For example, if I'm working on my RHCSA certification, I will ask generative AI to give me exercises to perform in my lab without the answers. So then I go and I try and do said tasks in my lab and see if I can get the results that I'm shooting for in terms of a desired state. Uh, the other way I use generative AI is to ask it questions. I say, give me three truths and a lie about AutoFS or NFS, and I will create the exercises via generative AI as a way to study and validate what I do know. And how does it differ compared to how you used to study? Oh, uh, the way I used to study was uh, just lots of reading of man pages, right? Uh, lots of reading of different books and, and online threads. Now I can go to generative AI and say, hey, how do I do a given task? And I'll use NFS as an example. How do I build a, uh, a mounted NFS partition uh, that is uh, persistent upon reboot? And it'll spell out the steps for me. I'll validate it against mine or what I know to be true. And then I can use that as a uh, double uh, validation method, um, which is much different than reading a book, asking several other people, did I do this right? The good old days. <laughs> All right, time management. This is a huge part of studying for anything. Your job, it's a, a huge part of it is managing your time effectively. So we're gonna talk to Jordan here. So with all the training and certification requirements for both essays, consultants, even engineers, how do you manage your time for both your job and your study and completing your training on time? Yeah, it's a balance that requires organizational skills, discipline, and a little bit of luck. Uh, being a solution architect, I am a part of the sales team, so that means that it, you know the way I work moves in cycles. Uh, there's a week where I have to do a lot of studying and um, for a customer, if they have a specific question, it's gonna take basically my whole week. And to be honest, I'm not gonna wanna do any studying that I'm interested in after work. It's just, I'm, I'm not gonna have the energy to. But if I find a week where you know the customer isn't keeping me as busy, I can set some time on my schedule to and stay disciplined with that schedule, ensure that I'm getting the studying done that I'm interested in. Um, and of course that relates to my job, so I can keep that holistic um, studying. All right, this question is for Randy. Can you share your thoughts on the balance between deepening your expertise in a specific area and broadening your knowledge across multiple domains? Generalist versus, versus specialist. Okay, so this is a, a bit of a loaded question because I work in automation and I'm very fortunate that I do because I leverage Ansible as my tool. That being said, I get to automate just about everything. If it's a load balancer, if it's a switch, if it's storage, if it's an OS, whether it's Windows or Linux. So I get to stay very, very broad in my day-to-day -day, uh, tasks or what I'm doing for uh, an organization or a client. And so for me, it's very, very broad. On those topics that I need to go deep in, I have to take that time to myself and actually do those kind of things in my lab that maybe I'm uh, 
validating a solution that I may propose to a client that I can't necessarily do in a client's environment. So then I have to go deep in the waters for things like that. All right. So that's a little bit about time management, but how do we keep those certs? How do we upskill? How do we grow our skill base? From job to job, from role to role, from company to company, there's a lot that goes into that. So I'm gonna ask this question of Kush. How do you balance your continuous learning and your skill development alongside your certification goals? Well, it's actually simple, I don't. Uh, no, uh, w the primary way I would like to focus on my continuous learning, because uh, I'm also a sales guy, is focusing on whatever my customer is trying to do. So they will typically dictate what I am going to prioritize on. If they have a messed up or they're trying to start up on identity management through free IPA, you best believe I'm going to be focusing on free IPA and learning how that works intricately, not just on what their specific requirements are. Let's say they want to focus on PIV or CAC authentication. That's great, but I need to also go deeper into how do you manage privileges across that installation. So for pseudo rules across groups and accounts, uh, and how you can manage that effectively within an organization. I'm going to be starting to learn about that ahead of time because I'm going to be anticipating that not only from that customer, but from other customers who want to implement similar things. And it's not just about focusing on one domain in particular, or one product or even project in particular. It's about keeping in mind of the holistic vision and keeping up with the breadth of knowledge required for something like identity management, like knowing how Linux works, knowing how OAuth or SAML version two works as well, because there's a lot of different ways to achieve the same goal, and knowing these different ways and why you would want to choose these different ways are important. So that's what typically keeps me busy and continuously learning and thinking. It's like, what, what problems could they come up with that they would want me to solve? All right, this question is for Randy. So how do you ensure that your skills that you acquire through upskilling apply to your work projects? This one's easy for you, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, this goes back to the answer that I gave previously, right? I absolutely get to work on any piece of equipment that the client will uh, let me have access to. So if today it's load balancers, I'm maintaining my skills on F5 or you know some big IP, some, right, whatever that may be. If it's storage, whether it's Pure or NetApp, if it's OSs, whether it's Linux, uh, RHEL 7, or Ubuntu, whatever those may be, I actually get to maintain my skill set uh, by touching everything. So it's really easy for me. Um, so that's it. All right. Let's move on to the pros and cons. So we're, we're in a, a, a very nice uh, calm spot right now where all we talk about is AI, AI, AI. But as with all things, there are some pros and there are some cons. So Kush, this question is for you. Where are we seeing the most benefits derived from Gen AI in the workforce, in science, in the news? Where are we seeing the, the most benefits derived? Yeah, uh, and you know, I can't speak for the entire workforce, but from what I've been seeing and reading within studies, uh, generative AI is fantastic at generalization. So taking up a large amount of data, either from a text document, a course document, or really just scientific data, and attempting to generalize based off of that data. Uh, that is great for summarization and not having to have everyone read the same exact document over and over again because they're able to get the key points and concepts uh, that these models are typically good at summarizing. Uh, we're also seeing benefits in running these models not just within OpenAI's secret Kubernetes cluster. We're seeing them be able to be smaller scale and not just these smaller scale models that run effectively, but even quantized down so they can run on computers pretty efficiently, and now even phones. And you can use Apple intelligence as a reference to how that capability is shaping up to be. Extremely exciting and it's great for uh, privacy, but also um, local inferencing times and just speed in general. Uh, we're also seeing advancements within science. Google recently released their AlphaFold 3 model, uh, which has uh, gone very well at predicting how molecules and proteins are interacting with each other. And that's going to be extremely important for drug creation and future um, cures that we might have not even thought possible within our lifetime. Uh, one of the Department of Energy labs, Lawrence Livermore, is working with what they call cognitive simulation. It's essentially a deep neural network that is focused on um, helping with simulations for fusion. So they recently, uh, the National Ignition Facility, achieved ignition for nuclear fusion. Fantastic discovery. Uh, but that wasn't too much of a surprise to them because they've been working tirelessly on creating a simulation model uh, made from neural networks that 
based off the conditions that they set in the experiment was supposed to achieve ignition. And all they did was just validate that simulation. That's extremely important because a lot of those experiments are extremely expensive and you know, getting closer towards those goals while not burning up all your money very quickly is important if we want to continue on that path of discovery. So tons of pros. Uh, cons would be like Skynet, just, just Skynet. Uh, and also, you know, if it increases the ability for people to create cures and these biological goodness, it could also potentially leave room to create biological harm or chemical weapons of mass destruction. So keeping in tune some of these errors and making sure that these models don't give one crazy person an edge in creating these weapons is going to be important going forward. So the moral of the story is innovation and not Skynet. All right, that's where we're headed. All right, so we're gonna get to the part where you can have some, some takeaways from these very esteemed speakers here. And I'm gonna start first because when I, my exam tips are, you know, I, I need to be able to recite what I'm saying. So using the rubber duck me method, if I can explain a topic, that means I understand a topic. And I use these Gen AI tools to help, like Jordan said, explain, to, explain it to me a little bit differently. Again, reading things, doing things over and over, that's insanity. Give me something a little bit different than I can, that I can uh, bite my teeth into. I love flashcards. I love the ability to be able to have my notes in my pocket. Uh, if I'm standing in line at the supermarket, if it's a really long OC command and you know you need it for an exam, you need to understand the switches, why not? Go ahead and just practice it while you're in line. Um, and find a study buddy. So a couple of years ago when I first took the solution architect for AWS, I uh, found someone online to study with. She was in Spain and we studied together couple times a week, we decided to take our exam on the very same day, and we both passed. I, I am a huge proponent of a study buddy, and as with, all, if you have automation, you can lab every day. Tear it down, spin it back up, do the things, make it repetitive. Those are my exam tips. Randy, what are your exam tips and examples? He has examples. So one of the things I like to do is I like to build my labs manually so before I go and automate it. So that will help me understand the objective at hand, right? So if I'm working, for example, on my RHCSA, I want to be able to do this uh, lab over and over again. So what I will do is I will build manually, understand minutia. Uh, I will also schedule my exam and commit to it. So if I say I'm going to do this within 60 days, I set that date, I, uh, I schedule that exam, and I go for it. The other thing I like to do is I like to teach a topic. Uh, this, uh, this I find is teaching a topic to somebody helps you understand it, helps you know the nuances of it, and then uh, I like to teach it to somebody who doesn't know it as well as to somebody who is very versed in it. So that way I can validate uh, what I'm teaching. That's a great way. Uh, I find a mentor. So I typically, even at my level, I have to find mentors to help me through my objectives when I'm doing things that are kind of out of my scope. Uh, OCP virtualization would be an example. I gotta find somebody that's gonna help me get through those, uh, those challenges. Uh, I use ChatGPT to uh, help me create my exams, uh, you know, give me three objectives for NFS, uh, RECSA objectives. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind that uh, it's a little dated, so you have to make sure that the objectives actually reflect what you're doing. Uh, and then I will also do three truths and a lie with my objectives. I say, hey, give me three truths and a lie for NFS. And then that way I can get the minutia. So if it throws the dash A flag is a, a valid flag, I can say, well, uh, nope, <laughs> right? So it's one of those things. And then I like to type it out manually over and over, get the, that keyboard repetition for tasks that I may be struggling with. And then it goes back to automation. Automate and make your labs ephemeral so you can repeat over and over again until you get it down. All right, here are your examples. So uh, my first one is uh, I use ChatGPT and I say create five multiple choice questions regarding mounting an NFS file system on RHEL 9. Use three truths and a one line methodology. Uh, the other one, complete an exercise for AutoFS that falls under the RHCSA objectives. Do not provide the answers, just provide a list of exercises to meet the objectives. And then I've got some other examples as well. All right, Kush. 
share some of your exam tips. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still a big reader, and I still love to read, even if it is a generative AI summary. I still tend to go through the entire documentation just because that's the way my brain works. Uh, when I think about certification exams in general, though, I like to stress about taking breaks uh, that are essential, not just in between taking tests, but even throughout studying, because burnout's real. If you're just, uh, certification exams tend to be a multi-hour lockdown session where you're not talking with anyone. That can be extremely taxing if you're taking a lot of tests or trying to do a lot of certifications. So always keeping in mind that taking a break is A-OK, -okay, is something I like to preach about. Uh, there's a lot of cool, um, Retrieval augmented generation tooling now. You, I'm sure you all have seen sessions around them. I like Notebook LLM by Google. Um, and if I need to run stuff locally, I use uh, anything LLM, which gives me local embeddings, vector databases, and even the ability to run my own LLMs all on my machine in one. So I can augment potentially like course documents for whatever I would really want to do there. Uh, there's a ton of tons of ways to pass these tests. Find out and experiment with what works best for you and just really have fun with it because if you're not learning, you know, what, what benefit is there? And uh, there's a short little example here. Uh, amazing engineers threw up this project called Instruct Lab from Red Hat. Um, it essentially lets you train a, uh, or really align a model based off of some type of um, question and answer documentation. They call it taxonomy. Essentially acts as a knowledge tree and it's not immediately clear how you can create these questions and answers that they require within that structure based off of some type of raw data. Thankfully, Microsoft researchers have also seen that problem and they created a fine-tuned version of Mistral that specifically takes in raw data and outputs question and answer pairs. So I just threw up a little bit of Python to format it into the Instruct Lab taxonomy. And it's little experiments like that that not only make sure I know what Python is and I still actually can code in it, but also working on containerizing that, so I'm keeping up to date with those skills while doing something that could be potentially useful to others. Wonderful. All right, let's uh, get to Jordan and his tips. Yeah, so <clears throat> start off basic. Uh, sticky notes are your best friend. Uh, like I said, these commands are hands-on. You're gonna wanna, if there's a command that's evading you, you're gonna put it somewhere where you're gonna see it every day and you will definitely remember it then. Uh, study buddy is great, not only for studying, but for motivation. I'm a competitive person. If my study buddy passes in, the same, in a week, I'm gonna pass in the same week. Um, Roll.rhu is your dojo. That's the exam environment that is as close as you'll get to the Red Hat exam environment. Um, so that's a great place to try out any commands that ChatGPT is giving you, for instance, or just to practice. Um, and break your chapters into days of studying. So the way that the Red Hat exams work in terms of studying, um, you know, you have a set amount of chapters. I'd, I'd break mine from, you know, chapter one to four for Monday um, and go on to the rest of the week. And I would use the graded labs in each of those, ch uh, those chapters and that's where I will make the commands muscle memory and just go through them over and over and over again so I can do them without even reading the question. Um, and then follow through with your exam dates. I know that's hard to say to, to some people who have exam anxiety. Um, so I have some tips here for, um, I guess these are things I just do naturally. That's probably why I don't have exam anxiety. But try to get a good night's rest. I know that seems difficult, but maybe do some exercises before to tire your body out so you do uh, get a good night's rest. Have a pre-test routine, whether that's taking a walk, um, watching some funny videos, having breathing techniques before the exam to calm yourself down. Um, and then use ChatGPT for specific questions and make sure you're always assessing that with the documentation and trying out those commands in the uh, exam environment. And then my examples, just here I have explained service accounts using analogy, so it broke that down for me. Um, and then I asked it, how do you create a custom role? And it took the context of the question and also showed me how to create a service account because if you're creating a custom role in OpenShift, you're most likely gonna, well, you're going to need a service account to attach it to. Um, and then you can see I'm trying it out in the lab um, environment. Wonderful. Well, we sped through that. We had we are very efficient up here. Um, we had gotten this down from 45 minutes at Red Hat One, pared it down to 35 minutes, and it looks like we finished in record time. If you have any questions, uh, we have a microphone up here. You can ask away, ask our panelists anything you have, any, any uh, feedback, we would definitely appreciate it. Thank you.
So with the generative AI becoming more prevalent, will certifications be relevant? If yes, will it become obsolete? Not at Red Hat. <laughs> I, I hear your question, and I'll let the rest of my colleagues answer that question. Um, I'm going to say no, because we all have to prove our expertise in a particular topic. Um, and I think most exams, not just Red Hat exams, it allows you to get a baseline understanding of whatever material that AWS or Red Hat or uh, you know, um, Kubernetes or whatever, you need that baseline understanding. And if you're hiring people, some people use it as a barometer uh, as for hiring. Well, they pass X number of exams, they may have this baseline understanding. I think that's what uh, certifications basically are, baseline understanding. The real learning comes when you do the job. Um, the <coughs> certifications will not help you get a job in that respect. Um, I don't think Gen AI is going to take the ability I don't think Gen AI is going to take the what, take away the need to be able to prove yourself. You have to know this up here as opposed to knowing it and getting a response back out here. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? Chime in on that? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Angela because certifications are really just the validation that you know something. It's not actually teaching you, or it's not like forcing you to learn everything. You need to do that yourself. And the certification is kind of like a checkbox that says, yeah, you probably know this stuff. Uh, you still need to know things to do things. These LLMs aren't fully agentic yet, I guess, um, to where they can do everything that you would do in your day-to-day -day job. We still need to know information. We should still constantly be striving to learn things. Just because these LLMs are good at spitting out their training data doesn't mean that's going to overtake human lives, creativity, ingenuity. There are also different use cases for work. So some people are stuck on a ship. They may have limited connectivity. They may not be able to rely on these LLMs uh, when they need to do their job. Or people who work in sensitive compartmented uh, information facilities where they don't have any access whatsoever and the things that are in those environment need to be very secure and sensitive. So having those considerations in mind and like being able to do the job without the internet is still going to be important, in my opinion. That's helpful. Times. Thank you. <laughs> That's called the before times, before the internet and before Google and before ChatGPT. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Randy, you said about like automating your labs. Is it possible if you could elaborate more on automating labs? For the Sure. So uh, one of the ways that I uh, automate in my lab right now is I leverage Proxmox. Proxmox is uh, open source, right? So you can actually leverage it. There is a commercial version. Um, if you can't, uh, if you don't have the hardware to, to do your own lab, one of the other ways you can do it is you could actually sign up for one of the free tiers on all of the cloud providers. And that means automating uh, your lab is gonna be a little bit more difficult because you're gonna probably start doing a little bit with Terraform. Um, you can do it all in Ansible, right? You just, it's gonna take you a little bit longer to get that lab to be that ephemeral desired state that you're shooting for, but it can be done. Um, I find that many PCs for sub 500 can be adequate to run four or five VMs simultaneously doing what you wanna do if you're doing uh, AAP or you're doing a, a clustered uh, build uh, uh, for like OCP, very low, uh, low resource. So those are some of the ways you can automate. Um, that's, but that's what I do. We have a question. And real quick, uh, before he asked that question, I did say that I was a dad joke ambassador. So what do you call a sheep that dances and sings? What? Lady Baba. <laughs> well, uh, as, a, as a young dad, young-ish dad, I guess, father of a little one, um, I'll meet that one and raise you. Uh, why is, what, what bagel likes to travel? A plain bagel. Okay, um, no, uh, my actual question um, was, so I noticed that uh, Red Hat has the, had the Q3 day of learning the other week um, where all Red Hatters, all Red Hat associates 
can kind of use some time during work to learn something new. And I noticed that there were lots of folks sharing, or at least a couple of folks on my LinkedIn feed, sharing, you know, LinkedIn learning certifications. Um, so I kind of asked them, you know, what, what do you love about LinkedIn learning? What's working? Um, and I also was asking if, if IBM has their own uh, equivalent to what Red Hat has. Yeah, I, I can speak on the IBM one at least. Uh, I've used LinkedIn Learning a little bit. I find their courses to be decently high level rather than in depth, at least to my liking, could just be my preference thing. Uh, but we do have access to IBM Learning. Forgot the exact link on how to get it, but you could look up IBM Training on Source and be able to find some documentation that could help you set that account up. But that's how I was able to get my IBM certification. Um, Red Hat does have access to it. Uh, as a dad of a teenager, I'm going to have to store that in my database. <laughs> um, I created, created so I, I wonder if each of you have an opinion about starting certification from scratch. How do you get from beginning from zero, getting to OpenShift AI? What is the chain of certifications you need to get there? <clears throat> So you would start, you got a pen and paper? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, you would start with 180. That is the basic course to get you uh, familiar with Podman. Um, you can start, also start with 188. They're very similar. Only difference is 180 has OpenShift involved. 188 is strictly Podman. From there, you'd move up to 280. Uh, 280 is strictly OpenShift administration. Um, and then you can, I say you're ready for OpenShift Vert. Um, and then you can move up to OpenShift AI from there. 288 now, that course is developer focused for OpenShift. I actually skipped that one because I didn't find it interesting. Um, but I think from 280, you have a good basis to move off to whether it's Vert, 288, or OpenShift AI. So I'd say those three, 180, 188, and 280 is a good starting point. Cool. You heard it from Jordan. Any more questions? Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for our panel for coming up here and sharing their certification journeys. Um, enjoy the rest of DevConf US. Uh, there's a lot of amazing sessions and amazing speakers. Make sure you star those and you follow your schedule and uh, take many breaks in between. Thanks for joining us.